Welcome to the Asia Economist, a webinar series from DBS Group Research. I'm Temur Beg, Chief Economist. Today we have the pleasure of having with us our China Chief Economist, Chris Lung, who will walk us through a series of slides on the conjunctural view on the Chinese economy. And he will also touch on the outlook, uh, particularly from the outlook of the real growth, but also what's happening in trade, domestic demand, uh, money markets, and of course the policy response around the uh, uh, pandemic as well as the uh, global developments. So Chris, uh, all yours, uh, go ahead with your slides, after which I'll come back to you with some questions. Okay. So, China is clearly building up its cyclical growth momentum. At slide two, of course, we know that China has already rebounded to 3.2% growth from almost negative 7% uh, decline in the first quarter. If the cyclical momentum of China can maintain at this pace, based on our DBS uh, proprietary forecast model, the economy may be able to conclude a positive 2.0% zero percent growth for this year and that is assuming the economy in the next quarter will go 5.4 percent and then the final quarter 6.0 percent to conclude the year at two percent of course um the supply side of the economy i would say has already fully recovered on the supply side and this is evidenced by the rebound of industrial production, fixed asset investment, and also on slide three, we can see clearly the oil refinery, especially in southern China, uh, has also come back very, very strongly. And of course, the manufacturing and non-manufacturing PMI, all the sub-indices are recovering very strongly with the, out, with the exception of export order. As a result of that, industrial profit already turned positive in May to 6% from a negative 4.3% decline uh, in April. So the supply side is very clear, has already recovered from the worst and the momentum is clearly building out. The situation, however, is not as good as the supply side is the external trade. So if we go to slide number four, uh, we can see clearly the PMIs of all of Chinese major trading partner, all of them are very much in the negative territory. Okay, and, and, and as a result of that, the outlook of external trade, I would say we mean uh, sluggish. But even then, the export has already went back up to 0.5% growth in June. Okay, But again, the outlook for trade remains very much sluggish, conditionally, la conditional largely on the economic health of our trading partner, which are not recovering as fast as China at this point in time. Now, at slide number five, if we go deeper, uh, to the export to GDP ratio uh, of various provinces, uh, we can see clearly that southern China uh, bear most of the negative impact of the fallout of uh, global trade. Uh, for example, Shenzhen GD export to GDP ratio is well over 70%, Guangdong is well over 50%, and Zhejiang and Jiangsu, etc., is well over 30% as well. And whereas the national average is only 18%. So the manufacturing sector, especially in the coastal city, especially in the southern China, will take more time to recover given the high exposure. And I believe this likely to remain the case for, for the rest of the year, uh, given uh, fashion, uh, the fashion between U.S. and China is becoming very, very intense now. 
Now, as line number six, uh, we can see that the trade deal with China, uh, the U.S. trade deal with China, is also not progressing as planned as well. Now, first of all, the trade surplus with the U.S. actually widened further to almost 30 billion uh, in June, and China's purchasing of American products only reached 19% of the target, and this is a big fall short. Uh, but as the Donald Trump administration said, uh, the trade deal is not really their priority anymore. So I do not expect the trade deal between U.S. and China will have any meaningful development for the rest of the year. Now, for the and and then at slide seven, uh, we can see um, the target, you know, of China's purchasing plan, uh, the type of product, agricultural goods, services, energy, manufacturing products. The target, this is what they promise, but against the actual numbers, uh, there's a big discrepancy here. So um, I do not expect this will be will 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 turn for the better. Uh, for the reason that the, these two countries are now uh, their relationship on all fronts are at historical very very low point. Okay, now but if we take a look at the composition of trade um, on slide eight, we can see clearly that ASEAN has already overtaken the European Union and US as China's major trading partners. Okay. So I think this is a structural change. The economic ties between China and ASEAN will likely develop further and get closer and closer. But I think this is also in the interest of China to reduce the reliance of export to US and possibly the Western Hemisphere. Okay, And the ASEAN will be an ideal partner for China, given they are culturally more resemble to each other, diplomatically easier to handle, and geographical proximity. So um, again, the outlook for ASEAN, between ASEAN and China, will be positive, but the outlook between US and EU obviously is not so positive for the rest of the year. Now, let's take a look at consumer uh, demand on the demand side of the economy uh, on page nine. Now on the right hand, on the left hand side is the subway passenger traffic and we can see the traffic of Shanghai, Gang, Guangzhou and Chengdu has already recovered to a level that is very close to the situation before the onslaught of the COVID-19. Okay. It is, it is, it is almost going back to where it was. Now, that is that is uh, that is also a reflection of the fact that um, the people in China are, af are afraid uh, are less afraid of taking public transport because at the beginning of the year or even in the in the initial stage of the second quarter, the Chinese people avoid taking public transport because of the infections, uh, the potential infection of COVID-19, and now it seems that uh, they don't, they are not, uh, they are not as afraid as before. So we can also see this as a rebound of consumer confidence. So this is not so bad. Okay, but on the right hand side, uh, the situation in the in the uh, in the labor market is less positive. Okay, but nevertheless. The unemployment rate, which a peak of 6.2%, but it has began coming down in the last quarter. But again, as I said, the, manuf the manufacturing sector, the outlook of it remains very much whole hostage by the recovery of China's trading partner. So I would say the unemployment rate will likely hover, you know, between 5.5% to 6% for the rest of the year in the manufacturing sector. OK, so this may not translate into stronger confidence, may not translate into stronger consumer confidence from the labor market point of view. OK, but from the passenger traffic point of view, the confidence has already returned. But it is hard to argue it is going to be much higher from this level 
if the labor market do not show notable improvement. So, at slide number 10, we can actually see uh, there are further evidence uh, of this why I said the confidence is there, but it is not going to recover uh, spectacularly going forward. Uh, the breakdown actually shows um, the rebound are primarily concentrated in daily necessity. Okay. Uh, online sales are clearly doing much better than retail sales. Um, but for consumer durables, um, the sales are not very good. And as we can see, uh, consumer durable like furniture, um, automobile, all this, uh, the rebound does not seem to be sustainable. Okay, so that shows confidence return, but the outlook remains fairly fragile. Okay, so let, let's put it this way. The, the, the consumption is not going to get worse. But to have a very, very strong recovery going forward, they need a clear view of the future. And they need a substantial, or put it this way, a fundamental improvement in the labor market. And it looks like that online sales will uh, continue to outperform the actual physical retail sales for the rest of the year. Now, as far as policy response is concerned, um, the major rebound of fixed asset investment is clearly driven by a dramatic surge of special infrastructure bond issuance by the Ministry of Finance. And in fact, uh, we can see the translation effect is actually quite effective, very fast, um, very fast. And I think the momentum in this space will be stronger as we move into the second half of this year, as we move into the third quarter and fourth quarter of this year. Based on history, China's fiscal policy always work because it is effective, it is very fast, execution, ex execution is very, very effective. And again, this shows in the figure, rebound of physics and investment in the SOE and also the private sector to a certain extent. So the fiscal canon is go going to be strong and it will be effective. And I argue this is likely to be the primary growth driver uh, for the rest of the year. Now, as far as monetary policy uh, is concerned, um, I think that China loosened quite uh, a lot, you know, at the beginning of the COVID-19. And then we have seen evidence of uh, loans, both M1 and M2, we bank very, very strongly. And that immediately translates into the sharp surge of the A share market. And as a result of that, um, it seems like that the PBOC is trying to slow down the loosening of the monetary uh, policy a little bit, given um, the translation of a huge one on the A share market and in many Chinese tier one cities, property prices are also. Uh, coming back strongly as well. So monetary loosening uh, probably we will slow down and, and, and I believe this is the right thing to do because think about it 10 years ago, China over loosened. Uh, and of course it created spectacular growth, but it also created so many structural problems uh, that last until today. If China did not over loosen 10 years ago, China would be in a much better shape now. So given the experience 10 years, 10 years ago, the Chinese uh, monetary authority are clearly learning the lesson. So they are slowing down the pace, but I'm not arguing that they are tightening, but they are simply slowing down the pace of losing it. Okay. So I believe that the, uh, in, in, in conclusion, I would say that considering the state um, of the global economy, which is very, very bad, and also the event risk of the COVID-19, uh, the Chinese economy, frankly speaking, are doing much better than expectation. You know, as far as growth is concerned uh, and the policy response is concerned, are more mature than before and they know when to stop and, 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 and they know what is effective and what is not effective. And of course, that to a certain degree, the external demand is out of their control. But as far as the management of the domestic economy, uh, I think that they have done a, a, a decent job, okay? And that is already reflected in the growth number. 
And we are quite confident that the Chinese economy will be able to conclude this year positively at 2%, given the wide policy prescription and the cyclical momentum that is clearly building up now. So I am um, I'm open for, uh, for questions. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, so let's start with the final point that you made that about 2% growth is on the cards this year because you think that there is a bit of a cyclical momentum and policies are in support of that uh, cycle. Um, last night, we got data out of Hong Kong. Yes. Uh, really, really poor data, very disappointing. And uh, as a result, I think we'll have to rethink our Hong Kong forecast. Uh, no, of course, you know, Hong Kong is not China. Uh, and, and mainland China has very different sort of, you know, uh, dynamic as far as domestic demand is concerned. But still, uh, the uh, situation related to COVID, situation related to external demand, geopolitical pressures, all of those things, Hong Kong is a microcosm of some, to some extent. So your 2% forecast at this point, you think is a balanced forecast, or you think that given what we're seeing in Hong Kong, as well as what we've seen in the U.S., in the last few weeks in growth momentum stalling a bit, that there might be some additional downside risk to your forecast? Um, yes, I clearly, I, 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 I clearly think so. You see, it depends on the, per step, on the perspective of the analysis. If we, if we just look at the economic numbers, okay, I think it is achievable. Okay, but right now, the wild card are the geopolitical factors, you know, whether the U.S.-China relationship will go even worse, you know, even with the possibility of conflict in South China Sea, all these geopolitical factors are difficult to factor in, okay, uh, quantitatively, put it this way. So I would say, uh, to be fair, I would say it, um, it needs some luck to reach 2%, okay, uh, but it, when I bring down geopolitical factor, then the downside risk obviously increases. I agree with this point. Very good. Um, Chris, uh, in terms of uh, domestic demand, uh, I mean, we have no idea what's going to happen with external demand, and you've already pointed that out. And we also don't know to what extent uh, COVID-19 comes back. So far, it seems like you know China has done a very good job of managing it. So putting those two factors aside and just looking at the underlying drivers of domestic growth, you think that levels of interest rate, uh, the liquidity that is coming from the central bank, these are at appropriate levels now? I think so. I think so. Because, as I said, the authority in China is trying to bring up consumer confidence by almost telling them to long the stock market. And the A share market indeed went up so strongly. And that somewhat translates into consumer confidence. And we already seen property prices also coming back. But at the same time, they also understand this strategy will not be sustainable because the Asian market cannot go up until the end of the year, you know, uh, without any major correction. They also know. So I think that at this point in time, in terms of monetary policy, I think it is better to keep the status quo, which they are doing now. I don't think they will cut rates more um, because they are afraid of uh, capital outflow. Uh, but this is largely due to the political situation. Uh, so I don't think they will cut rates. And as far as the reserve requirement ratio is, co is concerned, uh, if they cut further, this may also affect the profitability of the state bank. So I think that it is on the appropriate level. So that means the primary growth driver for China for the rest of the year will be fiscal policy. So I expect the FAI number to be uh, much higher, you know, uh, much higher and much stronger for the, for, for the rest of the year. If that happens, we may see positive growth this year. Yeah. Chris, do you have a sense of where the FAI is going? I mean, is it the same 2008, 2009 style heavy infrastructure or is it more smart infrastructure and, and better targeted areas of investment? Yes, it is no longer uh, building the walls and bridges like this. I think the infrastructure is very much earmarked, you know, for smart city development. You know, the renovation of the water sewage system, uh, for example, and of course, 
uh, in, in, and of course in investment uh, in print, uh, the print, you know, for, for technological uh, investment. I think they are doing a few uh, technological development strong um, in various parts of the country. So this is the plan, okay? Now, of course, we always do not know the exact execution. The plans are always great. It looks great. It, it makes sense. But execution is something that I don't have the full picture about execution. So if we believe what they will do, okay, and, 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 and indeed this is the remaining, the only remaining option, you know, they can drive both back to positive is through the FAI. So I, 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 I tend to believe uh, it will be okay. All right. Uh, Chris, earlier you linked the uh, reserve ratio cut uh, issue with the profitability of the state banks. So let's talk about the financial sector and its health. Uh, we worry a lot about huge corporate debt overhang in China. Uh, we worry about household debt in China and what that would mean for banks' profitability and banks' balance sheets. So give us a short assessment of the financial sector. Okay. Fairly speaking, the financial sector, the health of it, you know, is far from healthy. You know, I, I can say that the, the financial sector of China has no problem. Okay. But the same for other countries, you know, uh, who rely on credit, you know, to drive growth. It is not only China, it is for the rest of the world as well. Um, but why now, I guess, I guess the, the, the issue uh, is that the, 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 corporate, the, the, the corporate debt is always the biggest chunk, you know, and ch the Chinese government, no matter what, will keep them afloat, you know, by rolling over the debt or whatever. I think this is the same old trick. But I think the biggest issue now is they want to translate uh, the credit growth or divert the credit growth away from SOE to the private sector. I think this is uh, the, the key policy initiative for 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 a number of years. But the state banks are not really cooperating um, uh, uh, with the government, you know, given the huge uh, uh, credit risk involved. Um, so I think that the numbers right now, the credit numbers, I think it is in June, it is about 13.5%, something like that. But I think the composition of those remain very much going to the state sector instead of the private sector or the so-called SME. And I think this is really the big problem because the what the what okay, it is at such difficult time, everyone need credit, okay? Uh, everyone need a liquidity. Uh, to stay survive, but it is the private sector that need this liquidity the most, and I suspect the liquidity still very much goes to the state-owned sector instead of the private sector. So I think this problem very much remain. Right, um, Chris. Uh, back to the uh, U.S.-China issue. You had a slide on uh, the lack of satisfactory development on the trade side, but uh, China has um, floods. Uh, China hasn't had a great year for harvest, and you would think that the incentives would be aligned for China to increase its import of grains and pork meat from the U.S. So is it possible that in the next few months we might actually see uh, the trade balance going in the direction that Donald Trump wants it to go? Maybe, maybe. Okay. So the argument is that because China has a bad year in harvest, um, but, but China can also buy from other sources, right? Okay, China can buy from South America, I don't know where, okay, but uh, maybe it's hard, it's hard to say because the, the wild card here is the political factor. You know, if China can just buy their problem away, you know, by importing all these uh, agricultural goods from the U.S., uh, we won't be seeing the very tense situation between the two countries now. So on this point, I'm less positive. And I, I share your sentiment. And so, Chris, I think we both agree that even if Donald Trump were not to get reelected, uh, the change of administration in the U.S. is not going to make it easier for China to, sort of, as you say, buy its way out of this problem. I think, in fact, in a Biden administration, issues might be even more ideological on issues related to human rights and other things, whereas it's been fairly transactional as far as Donald Trump is concerned. Uh, you may remember last week in our uh, Asia Insights conference, Kishore Mahobani said, you know, at this juncture, who would China prefer? Would they prefer you, Donald Trump to stay on or would they prefer Biden? 
Interesting question. <laughs> we'll see. Um, Chris, uh, in terms of the external demand uh, for China, we don't have any control over it, but at the same time, we can make some judgment about how Europe is coming out of the worst of the pandemic. Uh, things seem to be getting a little better as far as the supply chain is concerned in Asia. Uh, what is China's experience, uh, both with respect to import demand and export? Okay, you mean the, you mean import from the European Union? Is this your, your question? From, from the whole world. I mean, which uh, uh, areas where uh, we're seeing decent demand for Chinese exports and which are the areas and goods that Chinese, China is importing? Okay, I think I I think I think the answer is ASEAN again. I think uh, China import quite a lot from ASEAN, and most of the the import is uh, again is manufacturer articles, electronic related stuff. You know, I mean, it, it, this is what the data set. And as far as the agricultural product, uh, as far as agricultural import is concerned, I think it is very diverse. Uh, it is very diverse. It used to import the most. From the U.S., okay, but now it seems its uh, import are not as strong as before, and it is importing uh, more the agriculture import from from South from South America. Uh, there's a clear divergence there as well. Um, but if we if we want to build up the argument uh, to see import demand in China uh, is quite strong, and that and we link it together with domestic demand recovery. I think this linkage at this point in time is, is not very strong. We need more data to substantiate uh, uh, this point. So Chris, uh, finally, um, you, you showed uh, us uh, in uh, slides nine in particular with respect to consumer sentiment, which has been recovering and also uh, which had died very sharply, has sort of come back. Uh, yes. Do you uh, worry that it, this is rather fragile and, uh, and of course, subject to uh, resurgence of the COVID-19 virus, that it would be wise for the authorities to extend, if not augment, support measures right now. Otherwise, sentiments could uh, deteriorate very, very quickly in the coming months. Okay. From a, logical, from a logical point of view, I think this is a fair judgment, a fair prediction, because the COVID-19 actually comes back, you know, in Hong Kong. And I read the news in the European Union as well uh, yeah, last night. And obviously the U.S. is uh, the worst now. Now, whether China can, you know, maintain, you know, uh, this good job is largely a function, you know, of their uh, administrative uh, uh, quality. Okay. Um, I would say that I would, I would tend to believe that the Chinese government do not want to go back, you know, to the draconian measure they imposed in the first quarter, even if the COVID-19 comes back. Um, I think that they will be more targeted when friends approach, you know, in specific geographical area, you know, if it comes back instead of shutting the whole thing down. Um, and and as, as I said, you see, they try so hard to they try so hard to um, bring up consumer confidence. And, and I think so far they have done a good job on this one. So for in order for them to kill what they have already done, I think it is difficult for them to choose. But of course, from a logical standpoint, uh, they should be prepared for it to come back. And when it comes back, um, when it comes back, then it is largely a function of the, the extent of the quarantine they are willing to, they are willing to, to impose, but I believe they won't be doing as drastic as what they did in the first quarter. That's my, that's, 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 that's my feeling. I 100% agree with you, Chris. I think, and that is not just for China, I think for the whole world, um, we had to shut things down in a very draconian manner in February, March, April. Um, but now I think uh, from a medical science perspective, from availability of protective equipment perspective and some degree of treatment on antiviral, I think we're in a stronger position to deal with the pandemic, even if it were to uh, resurge, as you say. Uh, so therefore, yes, there is no going back to complete lockdown. I think the cost of that would be too high. And I think the capability of dealing with that is better. Uh, and I think the Chinese have shown that just about more than anybody else in a more effective manner. Uh, Chris Lung, uh, thank you so much for your time and insights. Uh, this has been great. Uh, thanks to our listeners and viewers. 
Uh, you've been watching one more Asia Economist webinar from DBS Group Research. For all our research publications, you can visit uh, the DBS Research Library by Googling DBS Research. Thank you very much.